James W. Petley, third year PhD student at Durham University, uh, in, in, sorry, in Durham University's Centre of Extragalactic Astronomy. Under the direction of Dr. Leah Morab Morabito, who we've had her uh, speaking some time ago, very good, good difficult uh, one to follow. <laughs> so James is researching the evolution of supermassive black holes with an emphasis on radio astronomy of systems with significant black hole related winds. James completed a master's in physics at Durham prior to beginning his postgraduate studies, when he also became interested in astronomy due to the department's access to telescopes. James has a strong interest in both ultimate frisbee, that sounds very physical, <laughs> and jazz music outside of astronomy. So can anybody, everybody, sorry, put their hands together and welcome James this evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, share screen now. Um, here we go. All right, I'll just make you guys a little bit smaller in the corner of my screen. There we go. All right, so very happy um, to talk to you all today um, about the topic of um, supermassive black holes, and in particular, this sort of concept of uh, galactic weather. So I know you've had uh, a talk from my supervisor um, in the last year or so, um, Leo Morabito, and also, if you remember, I think you had a talk from uh, Vicky Fawcett, who's also here at Durham, and she spoke about red and blue quasars, I believe. So we're all kind of in the same parent uh, group at Durham. So I'm hoping to make this talk accessible to people who maybe didn't see those, but also bring up um, something new and a bit different for those who uh, who did see those talks. So a bit of an overview, and I'll just say, if you have any questions, try and save them mostly for the end, unless there's something really crucial that I've missed and you, and you need for understanding. I'll talk a little bit about me and how I became interested in astronomy, and then more on the content, a little overview again of what are black holes, but maybe you remember that from uh, previous times. And then moving on to the new era of what weather effects they can have, and I'll come on to what I mean by, by the weather later. Um, observationally, how do we actually know these things exist and how do we understand them better? And then just to end with, um, I'll go over my sort of research over the last uh, two years of the PhD. So about me, um, I grew up in Birmingham um, all my life <laughs> with, with my family, but an interesting uh, connection to you guys, uh, the whole of my mum's side of the family uh, all from Sheffield, um, Stannington, Sheffield, and they all still live there. So I'm in Sheffield very often. And actually my, um, my grandma now, uh, not my grandma, my auntie now lives in Elsica, which I think is actually pretty, pretty close to you guys. So I've last couple of years been there as well. Normally there, we're always there in Elsica on Christmas day. And I've been to Wentworth Woodhouse a few times and all that kind of stuff. So have a little bit of connection, even though I don't know if I've ever been in Mexico Swinton myself. Um, I was very interested in in physics kind of around GCSE time. I was always quite good at maths and that kind of thing. Um, and then I think it just took me as sort of the applied sense and actually working out real world problems and being able to predict things and stuff like that. Also had a little picture of my interest um, in music, but in the end, uh, definitely not a good enough to musician to pursue that as a career so stuck with the physics oh the top the top images are the night sky of Birmingham which you can see um, there's not that much observationally so that's maybe why it took me a, a little bit of time to get interested in astronomy went to Durham studying straight physics thought I actually might go into a sort of more theoretical side and particle colliders and that kind of thing but um, yeah astronomy took me in the end in the end I sort of specialized my degree in astronomy uh, so I got into quite late, probably about the second year of my four years of undergraduate studies. Um, I'm now at the end of my second year of PhD, but I'm happy to admit I don't have that much observational experience of actually going out and pointing uh, telescopes. We'll come on to how these radio telescopes and things work later, but I'm sure you all know 
a lot more about than me about uh, doing observations on a, on a given night. My main experience of that was this little um, third year project I did using the telescopes on the roof at the, the Durham department, which are probably similar size or not much bigger than the telescopes that um, you guys have access to. So these are 14 and 16 inch diameter telescopes. But I did a project on uh, tracking asteroids. And my particular interest was in um, whether sort of public observations of asteroids could actually, could actually help to their tracking. So NASA and other governments have various systems of tracking asteroids but they actually only take pictures or observations every couple of years of a given asteroid, just because there are so many hundreds and thousands of them. So my idea was if you combined their current predictions along with um, just observations for myself, how far off would be the predictions that I could get and whether if we sort of crowdsourced observations of asteroids, whether they could be useful. In the end, there's probably a bit inconclusive the results were very very close to the the NASA system and were only like a few I think thousand kilometers off over 10 years into the future um, which isn't that much in in space and a, and a long time given we only observed a, a few nights in a couple months but um, yeah this sort of really got me interested in, in, in astronomy and I think it was a really cool project to have access to and probably something similar to what you guys do in terms of like, I'm sure many of you observe asteroids and things like that. But anyway, on to something slightly bigger, uh, black holes. This might be um, sort of the previously, uh, previously held knowledge, but I think it's good to start at the, at the beginnings again. So what are black holes? At their core, they're the, just the most dominant example of the force of gravity. And this is when um, the, the force is so strong that uh, if you calculate the escape velocity, it's greater than the speed of light, i.e. nothing can escape because nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And the point where you reach that is called the event horizon, which you may have heard of before. They've been theorised for a very, very long time, long before general relativity, and just the concept of uh, once gravity was well understood, well, what's the limit and, and how far can it go? And people came up with these terms of like dark stars and things very, very early on. But the modern understanding of how the physics actually work and some of the strange effects that can happen around black holes really didn't emerge until after Einstein's general theory of relativity and the idea of the, the space-time curving around these objects in very peculiar ways. How do we actually know they exist more than... Uh, sort of mere theory, mere curiosity. Well, there's been uh, a lot of progress in recent years that you may have seen, but there has been, um, I mean, directly of a black hole, some indirect methods uh, for quite a while that made us very confident that they exist, mostly by looking at stars at the center of the galaxy. And some of them have very fast moving elliptical orbits at points and seemingly orbiting around nothing. And if you do the calculations of how, how much mass must be in this sort of dark space, um, given the orbits of stars around it, you could work out that in this tiny space, there was some object that was millions of times the mass of the sun. And it was you know, assumed that this was the only possible explanation. This talk might be a bit different a few years ago, but we've just made brilliant, brilliant progress recently. And now we have two very direct methods of actually observing black holes. The first is using gravitational waves. I believe that was in 2014, the, the LIGO detection of two black holes merging. And the second is using kind of radio observations. It's strictly uh, submillimeter, so a bit higher frequency, but um, you'll recognize them if you saw them as sort of big radio dishes. Um, and these are the two so examples, so LIGO here was the gravitational wave detector with lasers stretching, I think, four kilometers each way and using interference patterns to detect space moving in along the direction of the laser. And here's that really famous image recently of uh, the black, black hole made by the Event Horizon Telescope. And there's now even an image of the black hole uh, in our own galaxy that looks quite similar. But 
this is only a handful of cases. I think uh, gravitational waves, I think we're on the order of about 100 detections now. And the uh, Event Horizon Telescope with the, the direct imaging is just three targets. So with that, I probably couldn't do much research. So we need other ways of detecting black holes um, and building up our understanding of them. And these have been done for a while, but the main method is to not observe the black hole itself, but sort of observe the uh, emission that can be created by things around the black hole. So there's this idea of accretion and that as matter falls onto a black hole, uh, there's so much potential energy because the gravitational force is so strong and that energy can go somewhere. And so this potential energy that the material has as it's near a black hole, it gets sped up and it's really dense. And this basically just creates heat. Um, so the area directly around the black hole is just super, super hot and you can create these very, very bright sources. Um, and basically there's certain sources out in distant space that are just so, so bright, they cannot possibly be from stars. Um, and there's other things we can look at to see that they don't look like a normal galaxy and this is the only explanation. So here's a little pictorial idea of accretion. So here's an example of uh, an actual sort of star falling onto a smaller black hole. So this isn't really an idea of what it would look like in the middle of a galaxy, but this is maybe a black hole similar-ish to the a few solar masses or something and just a star being stripped off of its material and being heated up as it rotates around the black hole. What are most black holes like? So there's basically two main groups. There are sort of smaller mass black holes and then there are these supermassive uh, black holes. Um, and the small ones sort of vary from maybe what's the mass of the sun to a few hundred times the mass of the sun. And there's quite a big gap and then we get into the realm of the supermassive black holes, which are millions, even billions of times the, the mass of the sun. So one of the big questions that uh, we sort of work on in general is how do we go from these small black holes to these really, really massive ones? And, and the growth of black holes is still quite a big area of research and a sort of open question because it's known that you can't just form a black hole a million times the mass of the sun instantaneously they need to grow from these smaller ones to reach these massive sizes and actually i'm going to a conference in iceland uh, end of next week which is called the growth of supermassive black holes and should be a, a exciting time where uh, all the world leaders on, on this topic will have lots of uh, discussions so the main open questions are um, why is there a supermassive black hole at the centre of any galaxy? So you may have seen these kind of um, filament type uh, pictures of how galaxies are structured in the universe. And at the centre of each galaxy, there's a black hole. And at the larger filament kind of areas over here, there are even bigger black holes. And at first, this might seem natural because they're really massive and they have this huge mass and they're just pulling everything around them. But... Um, Actually, gravitationally, black holes are still quite small in comparison to their galaxy. So the Milky Way, the black hole at the centre of the Milky Way, is, I think, 4 million solar masses. Whereas the total mass of the Milky Way is like 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12. So the mass of the black hole is maybe one ten thousandth or one. You know, this It's really, really small, one hundred thousandth. And... So gravitationally, the black hole at the centre of the Milky Way is having no effect on us right now. And it's even having quite little effect, even to quite, you know, small distances, you'd think. So the fact that there's one at the centre is not just as simple as it's pulling everything around it. The thing that pulls the galaxies together is just the mass within itself and the rotating around itself. So that's a sort of open question. Um, the other fact that we know that is sort of unexplained is that the mass of the black hole, black hole, as I sort of said here, scales with the mass of the galaxy. Um, and this again is quite hard to understand because it's not that it has the gravitational pull to suck everything in around it and get really big. So the mechanism that makes them grow together is a little bit more 
complicated. And the sort of corollary to that is, you know, are black holes actually quite important to how galaxies um, behave as a whole? Or are they just this tiny mass curiosity in the middle that doesn't really do much? We don't really know. But some of these things of the fact that there's one in every galaxy and that the mass scales maybe suggest that there is some sort of link. So this comes on to um, my area of interest and the sort of parallel that I want to draw between um, what I'm studying around black holes and kind of the weather and weather forecasting and trying to understand how you can sort of forecast the weather in a galaxy. So we know what black holes are, we know some of the big questions surrounding them, but what we really want to know is what effect do they have? And that's not gravitationally, because I've said the gravitational effect is very minimal, so there must be some other effects that they can have. When I talk about galactic weather, I'm talking about a few things in combination. So you may have heard of galaxy evolution before, it's sort of a phrase that people talk about, galaxy evolution, how do galaxies evolve? What it really comes down to is star formation rate changes. So the Milky Way, I think, currently produces about one solar mass of stars every year. Um, and we kind of want to understand historically and predicting into the future, how has that changed? And galaxy evolution is just the study of how many solar masses are being made a year in a galaxy and how that changes and why that changes. So this can be galaxy evolution in the context of our own galaxy, another galaxy, across many galaxies, across time. All these things will get bundled into galaxy evolution, but really they're just talking about star formation. I'd say the weather of a, of a galaxy is the current or basic condition within a galaxy. So this is things that are similar to weather on Earth. This would be the gas pressure in the galaxy, the temperature of gas in the galaxy, how fast it's moving, all this kind of thing, um, density, etc. And when we talk about black holes, the term that's brought up in terms of the weather is this term called AGN feedback, which you may or, or may not have heard, but really it's just talking about black holes changing the weather and feeding back into the galaxy that they're within. So I've got a little plot here that I'll try and explain briefly, but it's very key to understanding why people think black holes are, are quite relevant. So this is a plot on this vertical axis here is this density uh, symbol per magnitude, which I hope you're familiar with, with observations. And then this H term, which is like a sort of uh, unit sort of base term. And then uh, per megaparsec cubed. So this is per unit of volume. And this is basically the number of galaxies with a certain magnitude per unit volume and magnitude largely corresponds with with the mass of a galaxy so the, the bigger mass usually they're brighter so what this is saying is and obviously the the lower the magnitude the more bright it is which i <laughs> as a, when i was new to astronomy still confused me very much but um we typically have more uh galaxies with a with a lower well yeah a, a fainter galaxies right and the, the brighter ones are much much rarer which is maybe understandable. But the idea here is that this uh, dark line here in the background, this is what we understand from theory of how dark matter works and how we think stars form. And basically this was predicted a while ago and then we did the actual observations and you can see they don't match very well, both at the faint end and at the high end. And for some reason there are much less bright galaxies then we think there should be, ignoring sort of other factors that we know of now. So if something is stopping, or you could say maybe slowing stars forming in large galaxies. So for some reason, there are just not as many bright galaxies as we expect when we first ran simulations. And most people, I would say now, think that black holes, um, AGN is just another term for, for black holes, are probably the reason why there's this drop in star formation. The reason is, and it's more maths, but it should be hopefully more understandable. Um, we kind of understand how stars form. And this equation is 
sort of very key and, and taught at an early stage when understanding star formation. It's called the genes mass. And basically the idea is you have a cloud of gas and it becomes bigger than the genes mass, then it's going to collapse and form star a star or stars. And we know from studying how gases work, um, the various parameters that go into this, but the key ones are got temperature on the top. So just to establish, if this gets smaller, then we're more likely to uh, form stars. And if it gets bigger, we're less likely to form stars. So if temperatures are high, it's really hard to form stars because you want this cool gas that can all clump together and become really dense. Whereas if it's hot, it's pressure pushing it back out again. So you really want a cool environment. And then you can also see how density is important. So you want it to be very dense and very cool. So we could reduce star formation by increasing the temperature, or we can reduce it by making a cloud less dense. So when thinking about how black holes are going to slow or stop star formation in big galaxies, they kind of need to do one of these two things. They either need to increase the temperature somehow, or they need to reduce density by removing gas or making the cloud less dense in some way. So we want to understand how black holes can do this, which can be at first be a little confusing because we just kind of think of a black hole as this. It just sucks up some material that's gone forever. How is it going to heat up the gas in a whole galaxy or uh, push away the gas in an entire galaxy? The thing to consider is that the, the power available is very, very large. As I said before, the potential energy is just so huge because of this massive gravitational well. And as stuff falls onto the, the black hole, it experiences very, very strong friction. And the temperature around the black hole can reach up to millions of Kelvin. Um, this is a little diagram of uh, a black hole with different regions. And basically the idea is that each region is at a slightly different temperature. So at the closest bits of black hole with the highest temperature and then gradually reducing because at the middle is the most dense and most fast moving. And you have this different spec, just heat, normal heat spectrums that build up and give you this overall shape of when we look at a, a accretion disk around a black hole, this is what we see. And it's mostly X-rays and UV just because it's so, so hot and the black body the temperature is just so, so high. So there is a lot of power available and a lot of heat in the vicinity of the black hole. Again, though, this is small on the scale of the galaxy and how you know, the temperature falls off very quickly. But basically, there's a lot of power available. Um, and in these very excited environments, big, big things can happen. So when we think about observing weather here on Earth, we can take these measurements of temperature and the current pressure and the wind speed and all of these things. And then we have some sort of model of how weather connects together. And we have different stations around the UK and the world. And then we run the simulation forward and make some predictions about how the weather's gonna look in the next few days, right? And most weather forecasting now works on running a million simulations and if in half the simulations there's rain tomorrow they say the chance of rain is 50 percent and you know the modeling of the future based on the current conditions is, is really key and we can improve forecasting by either improving our models or improving the data that we're giving to the to the models in the first place and looking at galactic weather is, is somewhat similar um this might offend <laughs> many of you uh, here, but now we're thinking about observationally. I don't really look at optical images very much. Some caveats, but um, they can be useful in looking at morphology and things. But they sort of provide, I guess, what would be considered um, the sort of easiest weather uh, measurements that you could take. So, like, I would guess temperature and uh, sort of pressure is a, a simple measurement to take. And this is the kind of information we get just from an optical image. So here are, uh, here's two optical images from different telescopes of a black hole that I'm currently interested in and studying. And you can see you'd, it's just a really fuzzy blob. It's so, so distant. Um, 
And there is information we can gain from this, like, for example, the morphology. We can use different filters on Telescope to get something about colors, which if you remember, Vicky looks at red, uh, red and blue uh, quasars and black holes. So color can be very important and there's in interesting things going on there. And also optical telescopes um, often just beat other, other methods in getting a very precise location and, and coordinates. So um, having optical counterparts to other observations are very important um, because often you can have two systems that are very close to each other on the sky um, and if you're observing in different wavelengths you might not be able to distinguish them but if you have the optical just the optical image you can get a very very precise location and you can get the overall flux of luminosity which tells you something about the power of the of the black hole what i'm more interested in and i'm sure you're all familiar with um, is spectra which I kind of see as a bit of a uh, step up from images. So you can image with different filters, but spectra is basically having a continuous range of, of filters. And we know that light can be split up into its various components with a, a prism and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the key use of spectra is we can identify particular elements and compounds, right? So the sun has all this different like spectra that we see because it's mostly just from the black body um, emission is just uh, at a particular temperature on the surface and it produces this continuum. Obviously there's, you can look at different absorption of things with the sun, but if you have a fluorescent light bulb that is using a particular uh, vibrational mode of an atom to produce the light, you get very particular signatures and you can really work out like, what's inside of that fluorescent light bulb just by looking at the emission patterns. So when we look at galaxies we really want uh, and black holes, we really want spectra because then we can understand what they're made of, the particular elements, um, how they're moving and, and all these different things come from spectra. And I just wanted to show an example of um, a really modern uh, instrument that's being used to take spectra that Vicky is um, actually, I'd say quite high up in. She does a lot of work. She went out to uh, Arizona to control this telescope and everything. Uh, and it's called DESI. Um, and basically the idea is you have a big, big sort of telescope, big mirror, but you feed the light into all these different little, little fibers. So each of these things that are moving around the bottom is an optical fiber that can split the light up into uh, all its components. And there's about 5,000 of these within the, the focal plane. And each of them is a little robot inside that can really pinpoint it on the sky. So this is an example of how it moves to pick out all the different um, sources. So you can take one picture basically and get up to a few thousand spectra back of different galaxies all at once. And it's just really uh, gonna revolutionize how we do things. It's been observing for about a year or so now. It's got quite a long pro uh, program, but it's just gonna produce so, so much, uh, so much data. And just really quickly, they can get tens of thousands of, of galaxy spectra done in one night, which is pretty, pretty cool. So this is an example of what you'd see if you take a spectra of a, of a black hole. So again, AGN is synonymous with uh, black hole systems. And then at the bottom, we've got a, a, red, a red galaxy. So just a normal galaxy that's pretty red. Um, I, it's at similar distances and similar kind of uh, type of galaxy to what the black hole is living in. So the first thing you know is the at the low wavelengths, which is higher energy, right? So this is higher frequency. The black, the black hole systems have greater emission. And this is the observation of the accretion disk around the black hole. The other thing you'll notice is these like different emission peaks that you don't see in a normal galaxy. Um, and this is due to different um, excited states of atoms being achieved in the black hole systems that cannot be achieved in a normal galaxy because the black hole have this these really as i say they're really bright and powerful and they can uh remove electrons and energize atoms in in a much different way to how a normal galaxy can and the final part on this top one you can really see that the lines are quite broad so they've sort of been like smeared out um and this is due um 
to uh, like Doppler shifting, if you've heard of uh, heard of that, and they're being broadened because we're seeing actually how fast they're moving around the black hole. So some of the gas is moving towards us, some of us moving away, and this spreads out the line. So in these top uh, systems where we have these broad lines, we can actually do quite a good job at working out the mass of the black hole by understanding how fast uh, the gas must be moving around it. Um, and at what distance the gas is away, and then we can work out how big the black hole is. So this is some of the th things we can do with, with spectra that give us these different weather parameters. So rather than just knowing something basic about the luminosity of the system as a whole, we then start to know, well, there's this kind of gas, and it's at this kind of speed, and it has roughly this density. And we can start to build up this better picture of, of how things are working. And this is all done with ground-based, pretty standard optical and ultraviolet telescopes. But going with spectra, we, we learn a lot more. The next bit, which is what I'm very interested in, which is what uh, Leia, my supervisor, is a real world, world expert in, um, is radio emission. So we see a lot of radio emission from black holes. And actually, the first extragalactic radio sources were all black black holes um, and that's why they ended up being called quasars if you've heard of that term is that originally they uh, looked like these really small radio point sources in the sky and people thought oh maybe they're like radio stars so they were these quasi stellar objects which became quasars but it turned out they were all very very distant uh, black hole systems in in other galaxies and the reason we see radio emission is because as uh, charged particles, mostly electrons, move through a magnetic field, they get accelerated in different directions and their energy is changing. And the way this energy is released uh, is through emission of, of light. But this tends to be quite low power. So this ends up coming out in the radio end of the, of the spectrum. Um, but in other uh, setups, you can produce just through the same mechanism really strong emission so if you've heard of cyclotron um, and synchrotron uh, particle accelerators there's one big one in oxford they accelerate electrons around a magnetic field and they do it so well and so fast they produce uh, x-rays actually so you can power if you as long as your magnetic field is strong enough you can make this really really high powered but in astronomical areas uh, magnetic fields are quite weak just because magnetic fields are very weak on large scales. So the emission uh, comes out as quite low power, mostly uh, radio. And basically black holes can generate magnetic fields because there's um, so much charged material moving in a particular direction around the black hole that you end up with a, a magnetic field going the other way. And this gives rise to um, radio jets which are these famous like images you can see here with the brilliant uh sort of puffs of smoke almost looking like but this is charged particles moving out along the galaxy and, and then spreading out but there are actually other ways for radio emissions to be created that aren't these massive jets um and i i think leia probably showed you quite a few nice images of this type of thing but there are actually other ways that we can produce uh, radio emission that we'll come on to I wanted to give a, a little bit more information about how we observe in the radio. I know Leia spoke to you a little bit about what she's doing. Um, and I thought maybe I could take it a small bit, small bit further if you guys remember that talk. So you're probably quite aware that mostly in radio now we do interferometry. So rather than just using one big uh, radio dish and looking to sky, we combine lots of telescopes together to achieve a really good resolution. So you're probably familiar that the resolution goes with the, the diameter of your telescope. So the bigger you make the diameter, the smaller angle you can differentiate. And so you have a, a higher resolution. Um, in interferometry, we can replace this diameter of the telescope with the distance between telescopes. Um, there's a load of complicated maths that I'm gonna completely ignore. It's, <laughs> it's still very confusing to me. Um, you don't need to understand it. Um, but the general idea is that by combining telescopes across massive uh, amounts of uh, distance, we can actually achieve the same resolution with a, a radio telescope as we can with an optical telescope, even though the wavelength 
of radio is you know a million times larger so this uh this kind of mathematical improvement and development of interferometry has been really really key to actually being able to do um, good and useful astronomy um, at radio wavelengths and here's a little example of an interferometer called ALMA that's in the Atacama uh, desert of like 5,000 meters up in the air and I thought I'd add a couple other famous um, interferometers that you might be familiar with so this is the VLA um, my supervisor Leah just got back from a conference there last week actually so she was enjoying her time in uh, New Mexico um, and I think this is the famously in the movie contact but uh, this is a big series of dishes that you can move around in different configurations and do interferometry with another famous interferometer is the one that actually made the image i showed earlier it's uh uses telescopes all across the world to create just one giant telescope that's basically the size of a few continents including a telescope on the on the south pole itself um and all of these kind of featured big dishes as you can see here uh, big dishes and the, uh, the event horizon telescope also is mostly dish big dishes all pointing together but i want to explain to you why that's not really the future of radio astronomy and, and where radio astronomy is going here's a picture of Dod dodrell bank the lovell telescope uh, in the uk that i actually have recently been taking some data with um but the thing about these uh, big dishes is like they're really really expensive um they're really heavy they're slow to move. Um, you know, if you want to change to a different target, you're going to have to be waiting quite a quite a long time, um, which makes them more expensive in just running costs because you can't do as much um, astronomy in a given amount of time, and these things cost you know, millions to keep running. And also, we're just reaching the limit of how big uh, of dishes we can feasibly make. So, I wanted to tell you why the the future of radio astronomy is just random antennas in uh, in muddy fields but that the key fact is that we need uh, a lot of them uh, more like tens of thousands and the main reason for that is they're just smaller so we can do a lot with them which i'll explain in a minute but they don't collect as much light as a as a big dish does so we need a lot of them to be able to collect enough flux to to do things properly but once we have that they're going to be a big big improvement um lofar which is the telescope that I use is like one of the, the most powerful telescopes in the world and it's all just made up of these very simple antennas and they're really cheap and they're really simple to set up and um, we can get lots of countries involved because it's not a massive investment for another country to uh, want to build a station and really the main complexity is just in like combining all this data together and, and scaling it out across Europe and this is a, literally a zoom in basically of what one of these areas looks like at a low far station and it's just a load of antennas just pointing straight up and really all they do is when a radio wave comes through a voltage is induced and we just use all of this information of all the different voltages being produced all across europe to build up a, a picture of what's going on so it currently is formed of all of these different stations we've got one in ireland one in the uk the main hubs in the netherlands and everywhere um recently just added uh bulgaria's coming on which is as you can see actually gonna be the biggest distance we're gonna get uh and i thought this is where i, was, I may be pushing it but um i want to try and explain why this is this is so much better because otherwise it can seem a little bit confusing as to why we just have these little antennas so LOFAR is a telescope that we can't point because the antennas just sit there pointing straight up. So how do we actually, you know, look at a, a patch of sky and, and take an image? So the idea is that we point the telescope using software. And the way this works is that we have some sort of radio emission coming in and we have our antennas just pointing straight up on the ground. And from a particular direction, the light's going to hit one antenna first and then the next antenna and the next antenna and the next antenna and there's going to be a slight delay between all of the antennas and all of them are measuring a signal and then we're going to combine the signal and try and observe something but if we combine them all at once we just see a massive mess of all this emission coming from different directions the trick is we know how far apart the telescopes are and we also know the speed of light 
So we can add a fake delay between each antenna to simulate how far the light must have taken from a particular direction to get to the next one. So basically we can add a series of delays between all of the antennas to point to a very, very precise location on the sky. So all we need to do is have really good clocks so that we can add these delays very precisely and very, very accurately know the distance between antennas. And once we've got that, we can just add these fake delays and point to anywhere on the sky with all of these telescopes across Europe. And the magical thing is, it's instantaneous to just change the delays. So I can be pointing at one direction of the sky and just instantly slew to another direction just by changing these delays. And actually low far um, can do this all the time. It really rapidly changes directions depending on who's observing. Whereas with you know, the big level telescope, you've got to wait an hour to be able to slew to your next, next target. And in fact, the modern advances coming soon are actually going to mean that we can observe different directions at the same time. So um, once we have enough sort of bandwidth to collect the, the data in a particular way, we can combine signals at stations at the same time and just add different time delays. So LOFAR can be basically observing everywhere all at once because all we're doing is just changing the delays between signals. So in the future, you can imagine that these telescopes can be observing small patches of sky, but in all different directions all at the same time. So this is really going to be the, the future of how radio astronomy uh, goes. Finally, we'll come on to what, what I'm actually doing with all this. So I've tried to explain what black holes are, what the weather in the black hole is, what we're actually doing to observe it, and then I'll come on to how I've used all that to, to come up with some results. So I recently put out my first paper, which is quite exciting, sort of feels like I've, I've done some science. Um, you can see some of the collaborators here, so including my supervisor, also Vicky, who spoke here as well, very helpful. And the crucial data in my work consists of a big data of spectra and a big, uh, big data set of spectra and a big data set of radio sources. So that's why I've tried to dive into why these two uh, things that are, are so useful and how they actually work. And on top here is a picture of the uh, network of, of quasar spectra that I have starting right from our own galaxy and then spreading out to, to higher redshifts. And then at the bottom here is the current um, status of the low for observation. So you can see we're in the northern sky because it's a European telescope. And basically the areas outlined in black is what we've observed so far. So observe quite a decent patch of, uh, of the northern sky. And in the end, LOFAR is going to cover the, the whole of the northern sky. My work focuses on a, on a little subclass of black holes, of quasars, called broad absorption line quasars. I don't really want to stick on the detail too long. They've been known to exist for 25 years or so. Um, and the reason they're so interesting is that when we look at the spectra, before I showed you the spectra, there were these emission peaks going upwards. As the name suggests, these have absorption troughs, which is a little bit interesting. So not just emission, but absorption. And you can see these absorption troughs are very broad. So I was saying something earlier about how the broadening of the emission says, tells you something about the, the speed of the gas. And basically these systems have absorption that is very broad so that it's moving very, very quickly. And the key thing as well is it's blue shifted. So this means that it's moving towards us. So if you remember galaxies that are red shifted and redder, they're moving away and blue shifted towards us. It's the same within a galaxy. We take the spectrum, we see the emissions blue shifted, that's moving towards us. So putting all of that information together, it means that in systems that have these features, there is gas moving at a very high velocity towards us um, and this has been referred to as, as a wind so this is what I'm on about, about galactic winds and that often these systems are referred to as as wind systems because there's a big amount of gas moving at a high velocity compared to the rest of the galaxy and it's moving away from the black hole 
So that's the key thing is moving towards us, which means it's not moving towards the black hole. So somehow the black hole is sending out these winds into the rest of the galaxy. And some of them are moving um, 10 to 30 percent of the speed of light. Um, so this is really extreme weather. This is like a, a hurricane or a tornado or something that's being uh, directed outwards. So they've been an area of quite a bit of interest, um, but they're also quite rare. So they're only in about 10 to 20 percent of black hole systems that you see any signature. And I've picked a particular like extreme example here. So that's clear that you see these absorption troughs. And these are three elements that we've identified moving out towards us. So this wind contains carbon, aluminium and magnesium. So this is an example of what we can learn about those winds. And based off uh, these numbers afterwards, tell you something about uh, the number of electrons around that atom or more actually how many electrons have been removed. And by knowing that we can work out how strong uh, the light from the black hole must be to be able to remove that that many electrons. So this is the sort of detailed thing with with spectra that we can that we can pick up. Um, as I say, why they why they're interesting, we don't really know how the black hole powers the wind. Um, and I told you that they're kind of rare, but um, recently people thinking about evolution and time have started to think about what if we think about the fraction we see more as a fraction in time. So not just that 10 or 20% of black holes have these winds, but what about over the life of time of the black hole, they have a wind for about 10 or 20% of the time. So we're basically saying all black holes can produce winds. It's just that they do it over a certain time frame. So maybe they're actually much more important and could be present in all systems. It's just that they're only present for a particular amount of time. And we happen to be looking, looking at them right now. On the right, I've showed some data about uh, how many people are also working on this. I think it's quite useful to think about how big different communities in research can be. And these are all authors who have written sort of papers on broad absorption like quasars over the last 10 years. And the ones in big colors are ones that all work with each other. So this is quite interesting data we can pull out. So there's about five or six, uh, big groups working on, on this topic. I'd say in Durham, we're not really a big group. It's it's mainly just me and, and Leia. And then at the bottom here is the number of papers that each group is producing a year over time. So you can see like some of the bigger ones produce upwards of maybe five papers a year on the topic. So it's quite an active area of research, but it's not massive and I'm kind of expecting over the course of my PhD to meet most of these people in the, in the ring. Um, and I've met quite a few of them already, probably going to meet some of them in Iceland. So people are very passionate about this, but it's not, it's not huge. And I just want to sort of caveat what I'm saying is like, this is not the be all and end all of black hole, like observations or anything like that. This is much, it's a, it's a important piece in what's a growing picture of, of how uh, black holes affect their galaxies. So now coming on to the actual results from my, from my work. So they've been studied for a while. And the interesting thing that people found even back in the late nineties is that these systems with the outflowing winds are much, much more likely to be radio detected, like two or three times more likely to be radio detected. And this is a plot on the top, right? Showing that. So this is from my data here. In the green here is just normal black hole um, systems and they have a radio detection fraction so you detect them maybe 15 to 20 percent of the time whereas when they have the uh, absorption trough and the wind it's more like 30 percent and then you can split into further types basically the ones that have magnesium and al aluminium are in pink here uh, and they're even more likely detected. So the big, the example I showed you that had all three absorption troughs, those ones are like very, very likely to be uh, radio detected. The interesting part came when people looked at this parameter called radio loudness, which don't need to understand too much, but basically the higher the radio loudness, the more likely you are to see those massive jets that are the typical um, images we associate with radio. And it turned out, although they're so, so likely to be radio detected, 
they're actually not very radio loud and you're actually more likely to see with your radio telescope just a little faint blob. So they're very likely to be radio detected, but when you do detect them, you don't see very much. And um, this is interesting because these more quiet systems where we can't see much, we still yet to really understand where exactly the radio emission is coming from. So it could just be that they're really small jets that haven't yet expanded and become really powerful. Or there are other possibilities like star formation or the wind itself triggering the emission. So my work is basically, I think for the whole PhD will be revolved around trying to work out which of these sources it is. And this has a big impact on implications for the weather because if it's from star formation, then we know directly that the black hole is affecting the star formation, which is kind of like the holy grail of proving that they affect the long-term weather conditions in the galaxy. Or it's from the wind itself, it says something about the power of the wind. And um, the wind itself is creating magnetic fields and things, which could also be disrupting gas in the, in the galaxy. So my key result from my first paper, um, so maybe, maybe the beginning of a few, but uh, I do think it is important and um, there are people people interest, interested in this. Um, I basically showed that it's quite likely that the wind itself is causing the radio emission. So it may be quite hard to explain the implications of that, but the, the proof basically comes in, in this plot at the top, which I'll try and explain a little bit. So we've got the spectra across a particular wavelength, and you can see here some of the uh, absorption troughs. And basically in green is the average spectra for the ones that were not radio detected and in orange is the average spectra for the ones that were radio detected and you can see that there's a shift so the green ones the non-radio detected ones the base of the trough is at a longer wavelength which means it's not as blue shifted so it means it's a lower velocity whereas the radio detected ones are further away a further blue shift which means they're higher velocity. So this is basically saying the higher the velocity of the wind, the more likely it is to be radio detected, which probably makes some sort of sense, only if the radio detection is coming from the wind. Because if it's coming from star formation, there's various like reasons why the wind velocity would not change the radio emission. And similarly with jets, the jets shouldn't really be linked to, to wind in any way. So. I wouldn't go as far as saying this is proof, because that's probably what I'm working on for the rest of the PhD, but I think this is pretty strong evidence that the why we see higher radio detection in the ones with trust is that the radio is coming from the wind itself, which up until now has not really been known. The problem I've got, coming back to weather forecasting, is no one really has very good models. So I've got these measurements now of like, what's the current weather in this quasar? And I know something about the velocity. I know something about the radio emission and the elements and things, but no one really understands the physics of how this uh, radio emission from winds is, is made and how that might evolve over time. And this is really key because we want to have other ways of proving this, right? We want to have other ways of confirming this idea, but they're quite hard to come by. And really there's one paper that I'm relying on from 2015, where someone made a, a sort of simple toy model of how this radio emission would be produced and it works and it has similar values to what I get, but it's not that well understood. And I'm really trying to, part of the reason why I go out and speak at conferences and and things like that and talk about this work is because I hope to get uh, the clever people who can do all the maths and this really advanced modeling to become interested in improving the models because that's going to be quite key I think for me in the in the long term of proving this. So I've got to get people excited about the result on the top so that they work on improving the maths and the really detailed computer simulations on the bottom. Um, so here you go, there's uh, different observables and different predictions and these are various computer systems over time for the Met Office, where they simulate like millions and millions of, of different outcomes over many, many years. And some of them can predict weather 50 years into the future to do those climate change models. But right now I've got 
none of that. I've got some very simple maths and my nice results, and I'm trying to hope to, to work with other people's improved the simulations. My next steps, I'm going to be using the full range of that, that international telescope that you saw before to really zoom in on a lot of these uh, systems. And hopefully, if they're still really small, that would suggest that they're more likely to be winds and jets, for example. Um, so trying to find all this evidence to really confirm or deny the result that I, I already have. And I also have a UK data source. So there's a telescope, um, a telescope system and interferometer all around the UK, including Jodrell Bank. And we can combine all these UK based telescopes to create a very precise image. Um, and this is actually uh, at 10 times higher frequency than LOFAR, the European telescope. So I'm hoping to combine both telescopes together, uh, which again will, will help to like confirm or, or deny what's going on, because if they both see the same things, then that says something about what's going on in these sources. And I can reveal to you in the last, last uh, week or so, um, the first results from the UK-based uh, telescope. And it actually goes maybe against against what was in my paper. Uh, this is a, a, a broad absorption like quasar, so one with this trough that I think the emissions coming from the winds. And when I looked at it with the telescope the size of the UK, it has these two little little hot spots. And this is usually quite indicative of, of jets. So the actual size of the galaxy is somewhat smaller than the size of these two hotspots which suggests that a big jet has formed bigger than the size of the galaxy and we're, we're seeing that emission. So this is one of uh, many targets, but um, I think it's safe to say that there could be other things going on. It's, it, it may not be just the winds that cause the radio emission. It may be uh, winds are the most likely, but there can also be other things at play. And some of them, some of them have winds and jets, for example, like this one. So I'll, I'll finish with a, a little summary of what I hope I've uh, achieved in, in, in talking to you about today. Um, black holes now have many different direct and indirect signatures, so we can use gravitational waves, we can use direct imaging, but there are ways of observing millions and millions of black holes using spectra and radio emission, um, and that we're not limited to these like very, very direct um, observables. And that their effect on the galactic weather, so the temperature and how it's moving gas around, is being increasingly understood. Um, and that we hope in the near future to have very good models of predicting the weather in, in galaxies. And that my own work suggests that winds from black holes are indeed affecting the weather and creating big radio shock waves, which we can see from these little antennas, uh, mostly in the, the soggy, soggy Netherlands here on Earth. So I'll finish with that and um, very, very happy to take any questions about black holes, my, my work or just general life doing research or, or anything else. And um, also feel free to email me or send me, a, send me a tweet afterwards. James, thank you for a very interesting talk. Could I ask you to stop sharing your screen? Yep. And then we can uh, see all the usual suspects. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we do need to hands tonight, please, if you're not in the club room. As you can see, I have a little bit of light on the matter. Uh, wave at me in the club room if you, uh, or try and get my attention, throw a bag of crisps at me or something, uh, if you uh, want to ask a question. Uh, we've got Mick Nichols. Mick, can you unmute yourself, please? No, okay, Mick, can we have your question, please? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned about the, the, the spectra of uh, black holes. Um, well, spectroscopy is a little sideline what I'm interested in. Um, but I'm just wondering, how, how can you get a spectra of something what you can't actually see? Mm. So... As I say, you can't really directly see the spectra of black hole, right? There's no light coming from it. And what we're really seeing is the spectra of the, the accretion. So the gas that's being really heated up and moving around the black hole 
we're seeing that spectra, which is largely just uh, the, the underlying spectra is basically just the heat of that gas. So it's a sort of combined black body that mostly emits an X-ray and UV. But also we get particular lines from certain um, gases surrounding the black hole. And so you end up this combination of a sort of typical black body slope, but also these peaks and broadened peaks based on a particular emission of, of certain gases. So we're really seeing the gas that's moving around the black hole. Thank you. Okay. Uh, James, you were talking about uh, the wind from uh, the black hole. Sort of yeah. compared to uh, the uh, our solar wind from our, our star, Hmm. Sort of what sort of magnitude of uh, what we're we talking about? I, I mean, much stronger. The the I'm, I might just look the density of the solar wind. I can't imagine it's very strong, but the the density of, of these winds is is something like um, that. It's usually measured in sort of the, the amount of hydrogen atoms per centimeter cubed. I think is the typical measurement. Um, and it's something like 10 to the 22, which I think would be much, much higher than the, the solar wind. And also at a much, much higher velocity because this is being accelerated by the, the high speed of the black hole. So similar, um, similar concept as in, they are generally thought to be radiatively driven. So they're being forced to high speeds simply from how strong the, the radiation from the accretion disk is. And um, we understand that light can actually transfer momentum. Um, and basically the, the momentum from the, em the emission close to the black hole is being transferred into gas slightly further away and building it up to a, a really, really high speed. So the, the solar wind is also just driven by these outbursts of emission that accelerate particles towards us. So it's a similar process. But yeah, I'd say the gas, the gas around a black hole is much, much more dense. Um, and also being driven to a, to a higher speed. So, yeah. I was just about to say, with you going to Iceland uh, next week, you'll be crossing your finger for a, uh, a, a mass ejection sometime in the next. I few will days. be. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I would love to see the Northern Lights. I mean, I, I don't know when I'll ever go to Iceland again, and there's not really much better place to to see them. So. I think I will be out in uh, just outside Reykjavik in a field probably most nights, hoping hoping to see them. Well, good luck with that. Uh, John Lee. <laughs> Hi, James. Uh, fascinating talk. Um, a lot of it way over my head, but um, <laughs> fascinating. Um, yeah, this low far uh, telescope, um, you say it's operated by software. Um, I take it this software is basically doing the, the alignment of where it should look. Uh, and is yeah. that also part of the, when you change direction, um, you can just slew to wherever you want and everybody else does the same. Is that, is that what yeah. the software is doing as well? Yeah, so there's sort of two parts. So the way, I didn't want to get into sort of the mass of interferometry, but the way it works is we correlate the signals so they're just measuring a voltage over time and each antenna we sort of combine these these voltages um, and that's how we form the data but if we don't um, correct for the time delay as I was saying between each of them we're just seeing all of the sky at once and we're just combining it all and we're just going to get nonsense we're not pointing in any particular direction so the key of the software is to slightly delay the signal from different telescopes in such a way that we are pointing at a single point in the sky. So yes, that's the software sort of control is taking all this, uh, all these channels from all over Europe and yeah. adding slight little delays to each of them so that we're pointing at a particular point on the sky and then combining the data. Yeah. I mean, that's paramount to, to what you're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, wow. yeah. It's, it's really impressive how, um, the, basically the clocks are the key thing, like uh, really having very, very accurate clocks at each of these stations. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, <laughs> it's a tricky task, which is why the data I mostly used here is coming from pretty much in my first like paper here is mostly just using the stations in the Netherlands, which is a little bit easier to manage. And in Leia's talk, she talked a bit about the difficulties in, in going to all across Europe. Some of which is actually our own weather. So like the ionosphere, 
um, really messes with these kind of radio waves. And if you're just in the Netherlands, the ionosphere is actually relatively stable over that area. But across the whole of Europe, the, the ionosphere in Poland can be very different to the ionosphere in Ireland at a given mm. time. And these things, um, the ionosphere actually induces a, a delay itself. So you have to correct for that before we can add our own artificial delays. So it's very complicated, which is why I'm sort of only getting on to doing that Absolutely. now for the rest of the PhD. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, James. Uh, Mike, yeah. Uh, hi, James. Um, is there a, a dark matter equivalent to a black hole and could you differentiate? <laughs> That's a very interesting question, I guess. I mean, so dark matter... Gravity it, that we detect them by. Yeah, so the way... And this is getting quite this is quite tech this would be the fourth year of my undergrad type stuff here but the way dark matter is mostly understood now is uh, they're called these weakly interactive massive particles they're called wimps is the sort of theory people don't really know exactly what they are obviously right right now but they appear to be pretty close to massless particles and um, what this means is they sort of behave closer to maybe light or they're very similar to sort of neutrinos. For a while, people thought neutrinos could be dark matter. And basically, they're so massless, they move really, really quick through space. And there's a lot of them, so they build up a lot of mass. But they don't have very, very big mass on their own. And they move so fast, it's really hard for them to club together so they it's called free streaming so they sort of just move past each other and they uh, they're dark matter so they don't emit any light they don't interact thermally or anything like that so there aren't really any other forces to stick them together and like end up producing a really dense region so i guess i'm not a major expert i'd say theoretically you could have a dark matter black hole if you somehow manage to like get it into such a dense region it, it, it would have to though light could not escape but I think in practice probably they don't exist because of the well based on the current theories they couldn't really form a dense enough region to form a black hole would be my guess okay. I hope that's, that's a good question I've never thought about that but <laughs> that would be my answer thanks Mike uh Peter Lloyd well, thank you, James. I, I've got two questions. Actually. One is a quick follow up on the correlations that you were talking to John about. Mm -hmm. uh, who does those correlations? Is it okay? Sorry. Yeah. So the way it, it, it works is the these stations around Europe, they have their own um, correlator at the station. So at a particular station, there are hundreds of antennas. Um, say the one in Poland, there's a few hundred antennas and they combine the signal just of that station first. So they basically combine all of that to make one channel, which is like what the whole of that station was seeing at a particular point in the sky. Then that channel, which is now just one from a station, gets fed to the uh, University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And they have a massive supercomputer called Cobalt, which is huge and very very technical and basically all of the channels from around Europe are getting fed uh, into this cobalt station so cobalt isn't taking all of the antennas it's sort of taking um, still a few hundred um, very very like uh, fine-grained data but uh, there is some sort of combination of the data from the international stations first so it just produces like one stream for what Poland's seeing, one stream for what uh, is being seen in Germany, and then that all gets fed to the Netherlands. Yeah, that, that's why I think that answers what I was thinking. I was thinking mm -hmm. if if in some way the data from all these millions of antennas all fed to you and you do it, then they could all be fed to hundreds of other people. And, uh, and <laughs> the telescope could be looking at all sorts of different uh, different objects all at the same time, but that yeah. isn't possible. They all have to be pointing to the one direction at, yeah. at least for long enough. Yeah. So the, the question I originally wanted, wanted to ask takes you back actually to your slide number nine. And may I compliment you on numbering your slides, which is... <laughs> uh, 
uh, you were showing the distribution of, um, of black hole masses. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, an intriguing bit that I don't seem to explain, but uh, forgive me if I went to sleep for a moment. Uh, pair instability zone. And I just wonder whether that's yeah. something explained simply. So it's something that was predicted. Um, I think through, uh, so it's pair, so it's talking about when you have two black holes around each other, which is the kind of thing that we observe with um, the gravitational waves. So mostly LIGO detects pairs of black holes around yes. each other. And it was, I think, predicted somehow that um, these are the smaller mass systems that LIGO see. So a few solar masses, right? Um, and somehow they become a pair and rotate and then merge. And I, I think it's call it an instability gap in terms of if you had a pair of black holes uh, of like a similar mass like that, there'd be some sort of interaction between them as they rotate that is unstable and they wouldn't form an orbit that uh, ends up with them merging. So it was predicted that you, with gravitational waves, you would not observe any black holes or any pairs of black holes with around that mass in the plot. I was saying, um, what you're saying is not that black holes in that area don't exist. Th it's yeah. They won't be detected by LIGO. Yeah. So in the in the plot, I th it was like the number of black holes with the with the mass. Yes. And based based off observations, basically, and it's just saying that in that region, there probably aren't going to be any observations because of this. Um, I hadn't quite clicked that this was a live yeah, observation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, yeah. you. No Thank you. Okay. Have we got any questions in the room? No, I'm not seeing any further questions, James. I think you've worn us out. And, <laughs> uh, we uh, uh, we have enjoyed the big thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we give uh, James a big next one, Swift and Astronomical Society? Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure.